You're now diving into the fish tank. Sitting down with Seth Living, Seth. OJ, Ju- Juice Woo! Man, ooh, and this is strictly for them true Welcome men. back to the Fish Tank right here on the Miami Dolphins this Podcast Network. Seth Levitt and OJ McDuffie celebrating DJ Preach's birthday. Happy birthday, Preach. Appreciate you. And what better way to celebrate? What's up, Big guy? Seth? Hey, you doing all right, Juice? Man, you know I'm holding it down, man. Trying to at least. Always. My old ass. Oh, <laughs> Well, today, Preach gets to be older than all of us. We won't have to actually... 50 AF, just day. like you, Juice. Yeah, 50 man. as fuck. There it is. So, listen, the guy we have on now, we've been trying to get for two seasons. We know that he's usually busy when we're busy. Uh, right. Football season keeps him busy as well. Uh, he's on the other side of the country. But, Juice, I've told the story where you were the first veteran in the <laughs> locker room to actually speak to me, you know, when I was an intern in 1996. <laughs> but this guy was the first player who was wearing a jersey for the Miami Dolphins to actually acknowledge that I was a human being walking around that building, <laughs> cutting through the locker room, probably because he was, you know, he was damn near in a position I was. It was almost an internship year for him. No, all kidding aside, Larry Izzo dives into the tank. Is it's looking a little cool out there, man. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good, man. I'm just out here, uh, Seattle, enjoying this beautiful sunshine and, uh, the natural beauty that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. It's great to see you guys and connect back with you. It's been a while. Yeah, that's what's up right there, man. Hey, I love, you know, it's one of my favorites, man. You know what I mean? And that, that's real talk right there, man. You talk about a, a dude that came in, you know what I mean, busted his ass, you know, humble as hell, man, and just a great teammate will really literally, this dude literally will run through a brick wall, Seth, if He's you ask him times. to do it for his team, for his players, for his teammates, man. That's what's up right there. I appreciate that, Juice. You know, I got all the love in the world for you, man. You're a great, a great teammate yourself. And, uh, you know, coming in as a youngster, having you there as a veteran and just the leadership that you, you, you had and carried and the, the respect that uh, everyone had for you. Uh, you. You were a great teammate in terms of you welcomed the young guys in. I mean, I remember the first camp I went to, you know, you you were cool as hell, man. And it's coming in as a college free agent, you know, and, and seeing a veteran like yourself, you know, open and then, you know, inviting guys over to the crib and, and just to hang out and stuff, man. That was awesome to see. And then to be able to play with you for five years was was awesome as well. You got man. invited to the pool party, is? You got invited to a, a an OJ McDuffie pool party? <laughs> you could say, you know, we got invited to, you know. To the crib. You leave it at that, Seth. <laughs> leave it alone, Seth. We don't Wait need any details. <laughs> We digging? Are we, are we trying to dig up some old uh, skeleton? <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> You're invited to the party. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Hey, it's, you know what? Let's, it, it makes it makes plenty of sense, man. Let's just get started. You know, right from the beginning, man. With a, you know, a very special relationship you had with the Miami Dolphins, and that's with uh, Coach Mike Westall. And that's the same way my career started. Really, I didn't play much wide receiver. You know, I was really there to return kicks at the beginning, and you know, figure it out, man. If you had an amazing career at Rice. You know, I mean, the directors for tackles, you know, all Southwest Conference honors and, you know, and, and, and honorable mention All-American. You know, you and Mike, you know, had, had a real nice relationship, you know, and he showed a lot of interest in you from the beginning. So let's talk about the relationship with Mike and how it started, you know, and that pretty much set the same stage for, you know, your NFL career because, man, I remember games. And, I mean, I'll talk about how you did on teams because that's where you broke in at. Everybody was game planning against you. But tell me about your relationship with Mike and how that evolved and, you know, and, and how it is now. Well, Mike, obviously, I'll say right now, if it wasn't for Mike Westhoff, I would not have had a career. And um, from, from day one, like uh, coming to Miami and being able to play for him, that was the best place in the world for me. I'll just give you a little background on, on how it, that came to be. Like, you know, following my career at Rice, you know, the next step was I, I, I obviously want to play in the league. So I'm training in the off season and, you know, being an undersized linebacker, you know, back in the nineties, you know, they're looking for some bigger type of linebackers, you know, six, three, two forty, two fifty was like the prototype linebackers that they were looking uh, scouts would be looking for. So me being an undersized guy, I really wasn't getting that much interest from guys that were coming through rice, you know, looking at uh, different players that we had and, 
I mean, I would go to pro day we had, you know, talk to the scouts there and everyone was telling me, you know, you know, you're just not the, the size guy we're looking for. We're looking for bigger. I remember there was this one Washington Redskins scout that came in and this was probably, you know, in March, right around the time when all the pro days are happening. Um, yeah, I worked out for him. I ran a good time, you know, and then afterwards I went up to him in the parking lot and I had made this tape um, personally, like a highlight tape, just showing all the things, you know, that I, I was capable of, you know, you know, just a, a cut up basically. And so I made this myself at Rice, you know, we didn't have like a big video department. I had to bootleg this deal and it wasn't the best quality <laughs> tape, but it was more the content that, you know, I hang my hat on. So it was basically just a highlight tape. And I went up to him in the parking lot and I'm, I'm like, Hey, you know, Take a look at this before you leave, you know. In the parking lot, like those guys in New York that they're, hey, here's my mixtape. Tape. Sell mixtape. <laughs> Sell mixtape to the parking lot. I basically, I was hustling, man. I was hustling. Right. And so this, this scout tells me, he's like, you know, he doesn't even, like, take the tape. He's just like, you know, we're looking for linebackers that are 6'3", 245. You're just really not what we're looking for. And, and really, there comes a time where you, you got to just move on with your life. And, you know, because professional football. He said football, that? He said oh, yeah. that? He said this. And, and he said, wow. professional football, you could get really hurt or injured playing professional football. And so it's just not for everybody. And so that was like, a you know, one a situation where um, I got a little bit of taste of, you know, I had an uphill battle ahead of me trying to get an opportunity. So that was maybe in March. Come Easter, I was over at uh, a family gathering. We had some friends um, outside of Houston that, that we were close with. And I ran into, you know, one of my parents' friends, and her name is Suzanne Sutton. And she was like, you know, how's it going? Just catching up on where things were with me. And she's like, you know, I have a friend uh, that coaches for the Miami Dolphins. And I'm like, oh, cool. That's awesome. She's like, give me your tape and I'll send it to him. And so obviously, like, I'm like, you know, because I've kind of, you know, I haven't gotten much interest. I'm, I wasn't really optimistic about where this was going to lead. And so I, I end up giving her the tape. She sends it to Mike. And about a week and a half later. Wow. Again, this is a few weeks before the draft. But it's still the point where scouts were rolling through. Houston and still doing their, you know, pro day things and, you know, personal workouts for guys. So about a week before the, uh, a week after that, you know, I, I gave her the tape, I get a call at, at my old apartment in Houston. And so right away, you know, I get this call and he's like, can I talk to Larry Uzo? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, this is him. And, um, He's like, you somebody I, got money. Question. I got a question for you. This is Mike Westoff, Miami Dolphins special teams coach. I got a question for you. Who made this tape? <laughs> and, and the tone that he had, I'm, I'm really like thinking he's like pissed off. He's pissed <laughs> off because, and in my mind, I'm like, he's pissed off because he didn't like the tape and it was, must have been a waste of his time. And that was kind of his tone that he was, you know, speaking with. And he's like, I got to tell you, this has got to be the worst quality tape that I've ever seen <laughs> in terms of the production wow. of this tape. I mean, like, what is this? Where did you do this? How'd you make this tape? Oh, I mean, God. Don't they have like a video department at, at your school that could offer a better <laughs> quality tape than this? And I'm like, actually, I made it. And no, that's the best. I, I mean, I seriously, I bootlegged this deal. Like, you know, I cut it up. I, I did it all. I love it. There was nobody that helped with this thing. You know, I write. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> so he, he led the conversation with that, but then he transitioned. He said, I, but I'll tell you what, I, I really like what I saw on this tape here. So okay. let me tell you, I'm going to be coming through there, you know, in a few days, uh, working guys out. I want to work, I want to work you out. So I ended up working out for Mike and, um, you know, didn't hear much really up until a couple weeks later. Then I got a call from, um, you know, George Hill, linebacker coach at the time, or defense coordinator. And then, you know, he had seen the tape. And so 
it started to get, I started to get a little bit of interest from the Dolphins leading up to the draft. But again, I had no expectations to be drafted. I was just hoping that this would maybe lead to um, an opportunity to come in as an undrafted free agent. So, you know, there we go into the draft in 96 and I'm watching the draft purely for entertainment value because I'm not like expecting <laughs> to be drafted. But as I'm watching it, you know, I'm seeing guys that I played against get drafted, you know, and then I see Zach gets drafted in the fifth round uh, to the Dolphins. Look, Curtis Jones, a guy that I played against for four years from Baylor, gets from drafted Baylor. by the Miami Dolphins. And then right around the seventh uh, round comes around, and then I get uh, a call, and it's from the Dolphins, their personal department, and they're asking – um, if I'll sign as a free undrafted free agent, and I'm, and they're like, I'll pay, we'll pay you $1,500. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I would do this for free. Right. <laughs> um, so I end up, you know, signing with the, the dolphins as an undrafted free agent. And then literally like a couple days later, and I tell you, it couldn't have been the better, the, it was the perfect place for, for me to go, you know, and, and I ended up not really having any other options. Uh, it wasn't like there were other teams that were offering me, you know, any contracts. Uh, it was a perfect fit for me to go down there to, to play for Mike because his coaching style suited, suited me very well. Um, he's an aggressive coach that's going to find places to put players that would help them be at their best. You know, he has an open mind. You know, he knew, you know, what I could do well, and then he was going to put me in positions to to let me, you know, have the opportunity to do well. And uh, then also to go to where Jimmy Johnson was coaching. And so he's, you know, in his first year there uh, coaching. And so I knew, you know, that is another great opportunity because he's looking for fresh new faces. And so, like, nobody – you know, he, he was looking to kind of build the team that he wanted. And so that's always a good place to start as an undrafted free agent going in. You know, if you go to a place that's got a bunch of veterans in place that have been there for a long time, it's going to be hard to kind of crack that. But I was going to a place that was like, this was open game. Everyone's job, everyone, you remember that first mini camp, bro. It was like a full on scrimmage. Like everyone was trying to make the team every practice. And for a rookie undrafted guy, that's the perfect environment for a guy like myself. Cause then it's like, everybody's in the same boat and we're flying around and it was, it was just a perfect place for me. And so I owe Mike, you know, I'm, I'm very much indebted to him just number one to give me that opportunity. Um, but then also, you know, he saw something in me and he, he really, you know, gave me opportunities to shine, you know, throughout my time with him. And so I always feel like, you know, he was a, a, a great coach for me to be around. I learned so much for him, from him and just his coaching style. It, you know, as you know, juice, it just fit, it fit my personality, mm -hmm. you know, and if he told me to run through a brick wall, that's what I was going to do. You know? and, and you did. And you I did. Just did. I just did what he told me to do. And, and, and it, it led to some good things. And yeah. so for me, yeah. I'm grateful to have a coach like that to play for. That's awesome. It, it is just awesome. Do what he says, you know, and you're going to be in good shape. It, it did lead to a lot of great things is. And, and so, I, you know, Mike has always told us that he kind of made your career. So I guess it's true. You know, it's on record now that it's true. But, <laughs> but you also brought it up that it was a major time of transition for the Miami Dolphins, uh, you know, Coach Shula had retired. Jimmy Johnson had taken over, and and it was. I mean, you just brought it up. It was one of those deals where nobody knew where they stood. They stood. Veterans who had been there for a long time were getting traded left and right, day after day, and and, and Jimmy starts to establish who his team's going to be, and and it's a famous story. It's been told a million times over, right? Is that Dan Marino was the first guy to make the roster, and then this undrafted free agent from Rice. Larry Izzo became the next guy. Now, uh, you and I laughed about this. This story has been told a million times by a million different people. And uh, I don't know how much of it they're getting right. So now that we have you in the tank, we want to know what the real story is behind that. All right. Well, so <laughs> as like we talked about, I went down there for the, for the first mini camp and I, I, th I thought it went really well for me, you know, and like right off the bat, you know, going to a place, um, 
where they had drafted two guys that I was very much familiar with going, you know, Zach Thomas, McCurtis Jones, two linebackers that I competed against for four years in the Southwest conference. So that gave me a, a little bit of confidence going in. like, well, if they like these guys enough to draft them, they're going to, you know, hopefully like what I bring to the table too. You know what I'm saying? And so that first mini camp, you know, we're doing all, you know, the practices went, went fine. We, we do all the testing afterwards, you know, Jimmy, you know, praising me going through some of these drills that, you know, I was doing well. And so I'm getting some love from Jimmy uh, early. Then, you know, that carries into the camps that we had June. I, I don't know. We must have had like four mini camps throughout that period. <laughs> and each one of them were full on live tackling to the ground type of deal. Like I'm out there tackling Terry Kirby in shorts to the ground and no one really said anything about it. <laughs> You know, and it was like, I, it was a perfect place for me to go and, and just play ball, you know, Keith Byers. And, you know, I'm having just a blast myself just because it's like, these are guys that I've watched for years right. on TV. And now here I am competing against them. But so like leading up through that off season, I had a pretty good, uh, you know, momentum going into training camp. And so, you know, I guess, you know, the story is that I was the second guy to make the team, but really... We both know, we all know here, you know, a week before that happened, we cut Jack Del Rio, right? And so when we cut Jack Del Rio, in my mind, Zach Thomas made had the team. Kinda, he, 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 he made the team after we cut Jack <laughs> Del Rio. It wasn't said, but he pushed into the starting lineup. And so it, it was kind of the, you know, it's obvious that he's made a team, but no one said he made the team. So I'll just clarify. So I was really probably, <laughs> I was probably the third guy to make. That's the not team. how I remember it. That's not how I remember it. <laughs> All right. So um, as we go, we, we had a couple, another great opportunity for an undrafted free agent like myself was we had these practices against the Redskins and the Tampa Bay Bucks, uh, both, you know, there in Davie where it was full on bloodbath and, <laughs> <laughs> like live to the you know everything was live and so I think I blocked a punt you know in one of these uh practices and you know later in the film session we're watching it and Jimmy's like who's that who's that and you know Mike would always be like oh that's Izzo and then Jimmy he was kind of planting the seeds he would you know give me some praise and say you know that's what we're looking for mm -hmm. that's what we're looking for and so I was feeling the love from the coaches and that gives you a lot of confidence obviously you know you know just keep doing what you're doing and so those practices against those two teams went well and then we followed up the the bucks practice session there you know we can get into the fights that occurred later but i'll just say that <laughs> you know time. we followed we followed that up with uh, a preseason game against the bucks at home you know my first professional game and it went okay you know Nothing, you know, eventful happened for me. I guess I played okay, but I didn't really light it up. Um, and, but that was the first preseason game. So then we go into the second preseason game at Chicago. We go up there. And in this game, I really had a good game. You know, we were running kick return, uh, double four, trap five returns where I was a trapper. Again, Mike putting me in positions to excel where I, I had a – real good feel for just hiding behind that double team. And as soon as my guy was rolling down the field, just bam, decapitation, <laughs> your whole shot. It was beautiful. It was like, I mean, it was a perfect scheme for a guy like myself. So that game went really well. I had like three or four knockdown blocks. I was just chasing guys around, just playing like a man possessed, really. And that's what you got to do as an undrafted free agent. Juice, you know it. I mean, you got to play, you know, like it's every play is your last. Yep. And, and that's what I did. Had a couple tackles, maybe, I think I had maybe three tackles in the game. So anyway, that kind of leads into, you know, the Monday review of the game. And so right when we all walk into the team meeting room, you know, everybody comes in and gets their seat. And Jimmy starts the meeting off and he, he makes kind of an announcement. He's talking about like, listen, guys, we just played our second preseason game. I know everyone's here starting to kind of, you know, try to do the math. 
which you, everyone does. I did that for 14 years. Was like <laughs> making little <laughs> rosters. In the, during the meeting, I'm I'm writing my projected roster down, and I'm like, okay, we're gonna keep six linebackers. Where do I fit in? Blah 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 blah. But so every coach will tell you, don't do that. But it's it's what you do. Um, so he was saying, don't try to figure this thing out. Nobody here has made the team. Okay. Okay. Okay, maybe one guy. There's maybe one guy that's made this this team right now. And he looks down at Bernie Kozar and he says, not you, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't and know then he part. points to Dan Marino and he says, Dan Marino is the only guy that made this team. Okay, I'm looking for 52 more guys. And so then we throw the special teams tape on, which was great. Like to be able to, um, and all of these special teams meetings that we had, it seemed like the whole team was in there. Absolutely. And that's a great thing uh, that Jimmy and Mike did because it enabled everyone to see what was going on and understand, like, why things are happening, maybe, you know. And so everyone's in there. We're watching the tape. And as Mike's running the tape, you know, I, they, they show the, the, the trap block where I knock the crap out of this guy. And then I get up and I go knock another guy down on the same play. Mike's like, stop the tape. Or Jimmy says, stop the tape. Who is that? And Mike is like, that, that's Izzo. And then he just kind of nods and, all right. Then we do it again. I make another tackle on a kickoff. I go down and make a tackle. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa Mike, Mike who, who, who is that? And uh, Mike's like, uh, that, that was Izzo again, coach. And so, the, you know, a couple more things happen as the tape's going. Eventually, you know, we get to this uh, – another kick return where I go down and just blow up the, the R5 coming down the field. And then finally, Jimmy's like, stop the tape. Izzo, is that you? And of course, at this point, I'm like full panic mode in the back of the meeting room. Like, <laughs> why is the head coach talking to me? He's singling me out. Like my heart's pounding. I'm very nervous, obviously. And so he's like, is that you? And I was like, yeah, yes, sir. He's like, where, where are you from, Izzo? And I was like, well, I'm from uh, the Woodlands. Out, and he's like, where is that? Uh, it's outside Houston, coach. He's like, is that where your parents live? And I said, yes, sir. He's like, well, I want you to call your parents tonight, and I want you to tell them that you made this football team. All right? And then he stands awesome. up, and he looks back at the room, and he's like, okay, I got two. I'm, I'm still looking for 51 more. <laughs> and so – that's how I made the team my rookie year was, you know, it was a long process, but it kind of culminated in that one meeting room where we're reviewing the Chicago Bears preseason game. And he basically changed my life right there on the spot. But I will say this, the next week, right before the next game, we're playing the Vikings at home preseason. He walks up to me right before the kickoff. He grabs me by the face mask. This is Jimmy Johnson. Grabs me by the face mask. He's like, don't you go make me look like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> Put the fear of God in you, huh? Yeah, dude. So I still, obviously, even though he told me to, I made a team, I, I still had a feeling of like he could take that away at any moment. Which he could have. And there was a lot of pressure that I put on myself to kind of sustain, to make him look smart. I didn't want to make him look bad. That's how it went down. That's yeah. it. That's the yeah. story. Man, I tell you, man, and, and Izzo was spot on with that story, man, because I know that everybody, everybody was on pins and needles around Jimmy Johnson. Like he said, nobody had made that team yet, Big Seth. Nobody. We knew Danny was going to be there. You know what I mean? But then he makes the announcement about Iz, and now everybody else, you know, we don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> now we got the truth. Now Izzo, you know, he was carrying the one there, realized that, you know, Zach had made the team too. Uh, you know, and I wasn't even thinking that way, but that's that's a great point that is points out right there. Because, you know, you got another guy, Texas kid, undersized, you know, and Zach Thomas, and, you know, those two were inseparable. They were with each other all the time, man. So you, you alluded to it a little bit, is, but, you know, how much about Zach did you know before, and, you know, how long did it take for you guys to bond, man? How quickly did it take – how quick? How long did it take for you guys to become, like, buddies like you were? Oh, man, we hit it off right from the get-go, man. Like, so, I, you know, playing against Zach for four years when he was at Tech, I was at Rice. I, you know, everybody knew Zach Thomas. He was the defensive player of the year in a conference. You know, he was the guy. 
And so I had a lot of respect for him, you know, from afar. We met one time at the preseason Southwest Conference uh, banquet up in Dallas, like in uh, right before our senior year. I walk into an elevator and there he is. And, and frankly, it's like, you know, you, you looked at him and I, I, you know, I'm like, man, this guy's not much bigger than I am. And <laughs> That's right. Size him up. Size him up. He's a beast, you know, uh, but I always kind of gained confidence by that. I was like, if this guy, he, he's preseason All-American, you know, I got some hope. You know, I got a little hope here. But um, that was our first casual encounter. And then, obviously, we get uh, room together uh, in, in um, I think, in the second, you know, when we, when we came back from the mini camp, the first mini camp, after we – you know, we, we, after the draft, you had the mini camp, and then we went back to school for a little bit. And when we came back, we were like, let's, let's get, you know, let's get a place. Let's get an apartment. We had kind of gotten to know each other really well, um, you know, throughout the early process there. But right off the bat, you know, two Texas kids, similar mindset, similar, you know, mentality, just, you know, willing to do whatever it took to make the team. We were both in the, you know, the same position. We were both, uh, you know, long shots at the time. And so I think that that kind of created a bond, uh, you know, within the two of us that uh, we, we ended up, obviously, Zach's one of my closest friends to this day. Uh, but it, it all started there back in 96, just, you know, from going to the same team and, and then having real similar personalities in terms of like under overachiever type of guys. But I tell you, going and being around him was great for me. Um, because he is, I'd never seen anybody work like this guy, you know, like throughout that whole off season, I just tagged along with Zach, you know, like whatever he did, I was doing, you know, if, if he was going in and watching extra tape after, you know, practice and everybody left, I'd go in there with him. And it was great for me because it, it helped me learn the defense. And, you know, I, who knows if I would have been doing those things, you know, if, if he's not doing them, but I just, you know, he had such a great work, work ethic. Like, he was a great guy to pattern yourself off of. And then just, you know, watching him play for, you know, for five years, you know, playing behind him, I, that really helped me as a player, you know, just playing behind him and, and seeing how he did things. And, you know, those are on the field things, but just off the field stuff, we just had a real close bond. Uh, we both like to have a good time. Um, and, uh, you know, just a lot of fun, a lot of fun to be around. We laughed a lot. You know, any, anytime you're out with Zach, you're going to laugh a lot. He was a fun, <laughs> fun guy to hang out with. The same could be said for you, Is And, yeah. and uh, yeah. I know you heard the episode where Zach was in the tank, and we probably could have done a full episode of just stories about the two of you guys. But we covered a lot of material, you know, from, from the streaking at Rolling Hills uh, <laughs> to, the, to the fight in the apartment because he didn't have your back in a fight. <laughs> yeah. Talk about that one. Uh, yeah. Obviously, the uh, you know neither of you will w were close to making the Olympics in swimming. Uh, we found out <laughs> outside of the elbow room that day. Um, but there was a story that he didn't tell. Um, but uh, I, I know you can tell it pretty well. And and you were upset with him for not having your back in training camp. But I feel like you guys were out on South Beach one day, and he had your back maybe a little more than you would have liked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, this is. Uh... This is probably, you know, the uh, off season after our rookie year, you know, in February or March, you know, having a nice casual day at the beach down there at South Beach. What a place to be, OJ. I mean, yeah. I mean, 22 years old, playing for the Dolphins in the off season. There, there ain't a better place. To no be. better place. <laughs> and uh, we would make our annual runs down there. Um, on the weekends to just enjoy what Miami had to offer. And so this one time, I think we had been hanging out at the, uh, that spot with the, the smoothies, the frozen. Wet willies or fat twos? Wet willies. Oh, geez, yeah. brutal. <laughs> Call a cab. Yep. You know, having a couple of those, obviously, and enjoying, you know, what Miami has to offer there. Um, and so as soon as we're done, we're, we're waiting in line uh, outside uh, what Willie's for our car and um, this car pulls up right in front of us and they, they have some bicycles on the back of the car 
and I'm, I'm just a knucklehead, you know, thinking <laughs> this would be funny. I run up to the car and I start like grabbing the bikes off the, the back of the car. And I'm like pretending I'm trying to steal the, steal the bikes. And so these guys get out of the car real, you know, in a threatening manner, I guess, you know, where they get up and they start getting in my face a little bit. And I'm like, listen, man, calm down. I'm just playing around. I'm not trying to steal your bike, relax. And I'm diffusing the situation. I got it all under control. <laughs> Nothing bad's going to happen. Right. It, while I, this is happening, something, I, I, I feel something fly over my left shoulder and it goes and it just lands right in this dude's face. And so I had no idea what it was. Maybe I thought someone behind me threw something, but I, I turn around and there's Zach. And apparently um, some spit had flown out uh, <laughs> of his mouth and it had gone on to one of the guys that I'm having this conversation <laughs> with. And so both of these dudes now immediately kind of take a step back, assess the situation, and then they kind of nod like, okay, all right. They get in their car and then they just drive off around the block. And to me, that was very cryptic and very much, uh, that was very scary to me. Yeah. The action that they had to this, I was like, bro, that ain't a good, this ain't good. Like, where are they going? All right. Where are they going and when are they coming back? So, so like, you'd have been more comfortable if they just started motherfucking you, right? right. Well, into, of course. Yeah. Get it over I, I with. Felt, I felt like a little bit like this thing had escalated calm. and it escalated, you know, out of my control at the time. And so <laughs> I looked at Zach like, what the, what was that? And so we just get in our car and we roll out of there. And I'm like, dude, we got to get out of here quick. Cause who knows where they're going. And in my mind, they were just going around the block and who knows what they're going to do. Right. And so we get out of there and we're driving back and I'm like, bro, what was that, man? I totally had, the, I had it under control. You didn't need to. And he's like, man, that's BS. You know where I'm from. We got each other's backs. We, I got my boys back. And I'm like, bro, I didn't, I, I didn't, it was unnecessary. <laughs> I didn't need you to chime in those dudes are probably looking for us right now, you know, about to pop a cap in us somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I thought was going to happen. Right. And uh, so he, you know, someone was driving us back, obviously, you know, we're, we're having this conversation in the, in the back seat here. Um, Cause we always had designated drivers, obviously, yep. you know, coming back, back and forth, long drive. And so Zach's like, pull over. Tells a dude driving us, pull over, man. And so we pull over on the side of the road, and we both get out of the car, and we're about to fight. Pull this, is like, fight. this is like I-95, right? On I-95, on the side <laughs> shoulder road of I-95, and we are full on in each other's faces about to come to blows because I reacted to him <laughs> reacting to this, to that. It was a total, you know, both of us just, you know, losing, losing our shit a little bit there. But thank God we had someone, you know, our, our buddy, I can't remember who, it might have been you, Seth. I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure who was there driving us. But thank God we had someone there to kind of diffuse the situation. But that was one example of, you know, I, he, he, Zach is a loyal, loyal friend. And he does, he will back you out of anything. I mean, he, has, he always has his boys back. And that was one example of him having my back when maybe it wasn't really necessary. <laughs> and then maybe, you know, I needed to just kind of shut up and, and let it be. Whereas I tend to kind of, you know, maybe instigate things with, uh, you know, wanting to talk about it more than it maybe needed to be talked about. Anymore. But uh, it was classic. On, huh? We got, we got back in the car and then we we were fine after that, but that was that's a funny. Jules, a funny can you imagine you're driving on 95, and then these two meatheads are like nose to nose on the side. And it, was that Zach Thomas and Larry Izzo? Right, like, right. 96, they had this amazing season. Right. Two idiots. They were they weren't no names at that point. They were no, they were no. they were pillars down here at that point. Unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, we were out of the car, literally face to face. About to down. Hey, best thing about it is, it's like pre like camera phone days you know what i mean so you know you guys, you guys oh, end up on social media thank god thank god 
we wouldn't we we would be in bad shape with phone cell phones now. I mean, nah, yeah, you guys would adapt. You guys would be smart like that. You know, you guys would be, be okay. You'd be okay. I don't know. <laughs> We're talking about Zach and Izzo here. Hey, but you know what though, Seth? Clearly, you know, you, neither one of those guys ever really backed down from challenges, man. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And that's what I loved about both of those guys, man. You know, in fact, Seth, I remember um once it back in nineteen ninety nine. You know, we drafted a big lineman named Gray Rugenberg. Remember him? Yes. I do. You remember Gray is? Ruger, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's one of those guys that came in with a reputation. He's all tough and nasty. He's nasty, tough son of a bitch. You know what I mean? So, you know, we're in training camp. So, in training camp, we try to be as creative as possible. You know, so we, we put up a little challenge against is versus Gray in a challenge that, you know, might make your stomach a little queasy. You remember that challenge is? Oh my God! I, to this day, it's, I, I love this story. All right, so was this the one in San were, Diego? Uh, yeah, we flew out to San Diego cross country for a preseason like practice against the Chargers for a yep. couple of days, and we were going to play them. So we fly out there, we land, we go to the hotel, and our rooms weren't ready. And so we're all the whole team is sitting down in the dining area just waiting for our rooms to be ready. And then we're going to actually have to go out and practice later on that day. But we're just kind of wanting to drop our stuff off and have lunch. And then we're going to go over and practice against them. So while we're waiting for our rooms to get ready, you know, OJ was awesome. He, he loved action. You know what I mean? <laughs> OJ always wanted some action. And so we're sitting there, Marino's there, and we're, they don't have any food for us. Right. But all they had, you know, you go to the hotels, they have like bowls of mustard and ketchup. <laughs> That's the first thing they put on the table, but there's no food. But so like Dan's like busting some balls, like saying, what are we going to eat this mustard? You know, can we get some food over here? And so um, somehow Juice is like, hey, I bet you ain't nobody going to eat that mustard. And I'm like, I'll eat the mustard. <laughs> and then so – one thing leads to another. All of a sudden, there's a bunch of money in a pot, and it's me eating mustard versus Rugemer, who, which was probably the most questionable decision he's probably ever made, was he didn't like mustard, so he's like, I'll eat the mayonnaise. And so it's, it's a bowl of mayonnaise versus a bowl of mustard. And so the whole team is around us. And we, we, it's like you have the countdown, like, okay, it's like a chugging contest, but we chug it, we're, we're chugging mustard and mayonnaise. And so I, wow. I down it, I down the mustard like two seconds. And surprisingly, he downed the mayonnaise pretty quickly too. It was like a photo finish, but I believe I had the edge and I finished first. And so I won whatever was in the pot. I think it was like a, a thousand dollars I Damn. won for chugging this bowl of mustard. And then Gray had chugged the mayonnaise. I got nothing. And so I felt bad, though. I, I'll say this, OJ. <laughs> After we, we got – as soon as that was over, the rooms got done. And, like, on the way up there, I ended up, like, seeing Gray. And I'm like, bro, I know it was a close call. So here, like, here's a hundred dollars. I gave him a little bit. <laughs> here's a hundred dollars. Yeah, I gave him, like, just a piece because it was close – and I and he did have the harder job to chug mayonnaise, but it was yeah. his choice. Right, and right, right. Chose to do that. But so the great thing is, so then we go out and practice. Yeah. And he, oh. you know, apparently the, the mayonnaise didn't sit well with him. <laughs> yeah, apparently. And so then, you know, the next day, Jimmy <laughs> in the team meeting we have at the hotel before we go for the next practice. First thing he says is, you know, he's <laughs> MFing us about like what happened at, at the practice the day before. And he's like, and you, Rugemer, eating that mayonnaise and <laughs> joking around. And he, he was throwing it up all over the field. Oh. And so he's a rookie. He's like, you just need to shut the F up and take this seriously. This ain't no clown show, you know, just riding him hard for, for what happened. So he got a hundred bucks and an ass chewing. <laughs> oh man! Yeah, I definitely got the better end of that deal. But that was. Now, Juice, that was, did you have a side bet or anything going on? Who was your money on? My Izzo all day. Izzo yeah. all day. Man, you know, it's, <laughs> is it's that a, because it was Izzo you know, or because it was mustard and not mayo? Well, you know, it really, I thought it was gonna be mustard on mustard. To be honest <laughs> with you, 
<laughs> you know what I mean? But Izzo, Izzo is not going to be- back down from a challenge. And you know, he didn't give a damn about anybody in size, weight, nothing. Izzo, was a, he's a competitor, man, to the <laughs> end. So the hell with anybody. I, I could put anybody up against him, and Izzo was going to come out on top of that shit. I love, I love it. it. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, look, Iz, obviously Juice has always believed in you, right? He's had your back, and you talked about it, how he, he treated you great as a veteran in your rookie year. But there is a story that you and I have talked about and I don't know that – Juice will remember it once you start to tell it, but he doesn't know it as you and I do, right? And so, so let's talk about Codename Trek. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about that one. Do you remember All right. that Yeah, well, okay. So I'll give you just a little background on this deal. So, you know, the environment that we practiced in there in Miami under Jimmy Johnson was intense, you know, and, and I felt at all times – during practice and I know other players probably felt the same thing that you know Jimmy was over there on the side or wherever he would stand and watch practice with his sunglasses on I always felt like he was watching me the whole time you know and that that was a great thing to feel like I gotta do something I gotta do this I gotta do that like because he's watching and and to feel that pressure you know and and and, and to play amongst that type of pressure that, that's a good thing to to cultivate you know, a high level of, of, you know, competitiveness within a team. But so there's this one practice, I'm probably, I think it was like a Friday practice. And so OJ, he's coming over the middle and I'm, I'm on the scout team. But of course, because I feel like Jimmy's watching everything, like I'm going balls to the wall, you know, I'm going a hundred miles an hour. And so Juice comes over the middle and like I go and I, I end up hitting him, and it was a total like, you don't do that. Like, what am I thinking here? This is OJ, our best receiver, biggest playmaker, and I'm hitting him in practice on a Friday. He still caught it, obviously, but he just didn't appreciate it. I was so mad. I was so goddamn <laughs> mad. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. I don't blame you, man. I mean, but just understand, I'm a 24-year-old kid that's trying to make the team every day. You know what I mean? But – no excuse for that. So I hit our best player coming over the middle. And then we have some words. And of course, I'm not one to just back down. You say something to me, I'm going to say something back. And so we have to kind of be separated. And then like, it kind of carried on into the locker room a little bit. Like some three o'clock high shit. Yeah. And then (laughs) we're still like talking and then we got to run off to meetings, but it's like, all right, after meetings, I'll see your ass out in the parking lot type of deal. <laughs> That's OJ saying that to me. And and, I'm, and at this point, I'm just like, I really don't want to be. <laughs> you didn't want to really, fuck me up, did you? Ed? You I, didn't want to fuck me up, no, did you? <laughs> I had so much respect for you, bro. And you're the, you're the coolest teammate. I'm like, what? What? how did I get into this with OJ McDuffie, bro? Like, I don't want to be fighting my man OJ here. I mean, what am I doing? But of course, I'm like, I'm going to go to the parking lot and I have to meet him because that's what you got to do. But I had no interest at all in, in coming to blows with my guy, OJ, at, at any point. But that just shows the competitiveness that you have. And then, you know, you ain't going to – you're the same mindset. You're like, not did anybody show up in the parking lot? Like, I want to know what happened. And so I believe what happened was things just kind of yeah. after practice – they just kind of time had a had a way of just kind of it just kind of deflated the tension and no the one there was no there was no meet up in practice i i think i left and i was waiting to to see oj where was he <laughs> and he he probably it, he was still in there working or whatever but no he there was no meet juice like those guys with the bikes and went around the corner man he was, right right it was like where's it yeah he's coming around the corner hey man yeah. i remember but, that man I, you know what i don't remember the uh the meetup in the parking lot, man, because I would never – I don't – look, I talk a big game, but I ain't trying to fight no damn body, especially no linebackers like Izzo. <laughs> so, I'm going to tell you that right now, man. And if, well, I'm, say, I'm, glad it, I, I'm glad it never happened, you know, because <laughs> I had no interest in wanting to, to throw great. down with you at all. But it was two guys that were just, you know, you know, shit-talking a little bit. Yep. And, you know – it's, it's healthy to have a little bit of that. It's healthy to have a little bit of that. And what I learned from that is you don't go hitting 
you know, your best receiver uh, in practice. On a Friday practice? <laughs> on a Friday practice, especially, you know, he's got a game. We got a game on Sunday. That was just unnecessary, but that was a knucklehead move that I kind of probably, you know, learned from as a player moving forward. But here's forward. the follow-up to it, Juice. So the reason it's called Codename Trek is that then I, I don't know where, uh, if it was a road game. It must have been a road game the next, the, the following Sunday there is. Well, then, yeah, we're leaving the next day to go somewhere. Yeah, and so we're on uh, – Izzo, Izzo and I are sitting together on the bus going to the game or coming back from the game or whatever, and he's like, hey, man, you, you know, did you hear what happened with me and, and, and your guy? I'm like, well, who's my guy? And he goes – and he's kind of like giving the eyes because you're sitting like a row or two behind us. <laughs> and, I, and I go, OJ, and he's like, shh, shh, shh. And he goes, let's, let's call him – let's just say Trek. I don't know where the hell it came from, Izzo. Let's just say Trek. So he goes, so then I went across, and Trek was coming across it. So he's retelling the whole story, but he's replaced OJ with Trek of all names. And that's what he But I, yeah, I said, hey, don't be saying his name. I, you know, I, it's, it's over. I kind of want to move forward. So oh, name Trek. Goodness. There's the, the No, that is, that, that is the first time I knew that I had a code name. That's not I'm gonna start using that one instead of juice. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that is a hey, man. And hey, you know what, man? And I love how Izzo, like, honestly, and that's how things are supposed to go. You know, we always have with with anybody on your team, you have some brush up, some beef, some arguments, maybe in the locker room, but the shit should never spill over anywhere else, man. You know, and that's just being competitive, like he's talking about, man. But no, shit. and you know what I remember, Juice, is I think the next week, because this this kind of was this kind of hurt me for a while. Like I was just like, cause I had so much respect for you. Like I didn't want to be getting into a, uh, you know, confrontation with, with you at, at that point. And I remember you came up and it was during practice and you just kind of came over and you said, Hey man, we're cool. Yeah. And that, I, that meant a lot to me, you know, to, to move past that whole, you know, confrontational stage that we, we, we found ourselves in, you know, but that's the shows what kind of person you are. And you too, though, bro. I'm going to tell you what is, man. You're, you're my type of teammate, man. 1,000% my type of teammate, man, for all those reasons, man. You know, we talked some of the stuff about you and Zach and, you know, having each other's back, man. But, shit, man, I will, I'll go to battle with you any day, man. And, obviously, there's a bunch of people that you've gone to battle with, me. 14 years in the league. You, big dog, you know what I mean? Doing what you did and, and balls to the wall all the time, man. You know what I mean? And to, to just to have that type of longevity and play at such a high level, man, uh, you, I mean, you you did it up, man. I, I I respected all that, man. I watched you from afar, seen you winning championships and stuff, man. And that was uh, you know, I knew how you got there because you didn't have step ever, bro. And I, I appreciate that. But I do have to talk about some other shit though. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> I remember in your second year though. You know, you got 14 years in though. You know what I mean? But you, you suffered a, the, the Achilles tear, right? So, I, you know, I had a real good rookie year. And then, you know, going into the offseason, I was having a good offseason. And, you know, we had drafted a couple linebackers. And so it was still like, uh, you know, I, you know, it was what have you done for me lately type of mentality. So I kind of had risen my level of play, I felt like. And I was really feeling good playing Will Linebacker. Derek Rogers had come on. And so – um, all of a sudden, after a couple of weeks of camp, like the third week of preseason, I'm going through the drills, uh, individual period, going through the linebacker, you know, the weave drill, and I tear my Achilles. And so that happened in July, late July um, of 97. And so I missed my second year there, the whole year. Yeah. Um, I actually tore it twice. Um I don't know if you remember this story, Juice, but uh, so I, I had, I had done the, re, uh, you know, I had done the surgery. Doctor Uribe repaired it. It was a real good, clean repair, and he felt that um, because I was so young, I was 22, that I was going to really have a, a good recovery from this. And so everything was going fine. They told me to be extremely careful between the weeks of seven and 12. You know, because you wear, I was in a hard cast for three weeks, or yeah, hard cast three weeks. Then I was in a walking boot for three weeks. And so that seventh week, I came out of the walking boot and I was wearing regular t -sh tennis shoes. And they were like, you still need to be, you're going to be feeling pretty good. You're going to be walking around here, but the scar is still solidifying. 
And so you need to be really extremely careful until, you know, for, for that seven to 12 week period until that scar, that scar tissue is all solidified and it, you know, it can't re tear. And so it was right there at seven weeks. You guys are out of practice. You know, my routine was, you know, go into the training room, do what you got to do. And then, you know, my workout at that point, because I couldn't run, I was doing a lot of swimming. You know, that's that pool we had. Little pool, that lonely pool in the back. Yeah. I mean, that, I had some great workouts in that deal. <laughs> and so, you know, I go back there. Um, I go over. I knock on the, uh, the door, the window, to get B-roll to come out to kind of like put me through whatever swim workout he, he was going to put me through that day. And so he comes out. And so, you know, you remember B roll, he was a bit of a close talker, right? <laughs> and so he comes I up. I like some coffee my, too now. He didn't mind drinking a few co cups of coffee. Yeah. And so he's all <laughs> geared up after like 10 cups of coffee and he's all excited because now he's got someone he can train. And so he walks out. And he kind of gets up in my face. He's like, what are we, we going to do? What do you want to do? And I'm just like uh, backing up a little bit because he's kind of in my zone a little. A little personal so space. I, end up, I end up tripping over one of those potted plants that they have out there on the pool deck. And I, I try to catch myself, you know, when I, and it's just a reactionary type of deal. I put my left foot back to kind of regain my balance. Oh. And all of a sudden, I feel something. And I looked down at my left leg and I got blood coming out of my sock and oh. I had a re-tear of, of the surgery. Oh. And so we kind of limp back into the uh, training room. Brad kind of carries me back in there and then they're like, what, what just happened? And unfortunately I had a, you know, the, it's interesting. The tear that Uribe originally repaired was intact, but, the uh, the new tear was a little higher because just that shows that his repair really held. It just retore in a different place, and so I had to go do that surgery all over again. And then at that point, you know, um, a second Achilles tear. They were real cautious with um, the re rehab. So the first time, the first go around. I was in a cast for three weeks. Well, the second go around, I was in a cast for six weeks. And then I was in a cast for a uh, walking boot for another six weeks. So it was like 12 weeks of- They didn't uh, trust you, Izzo. They didn't trust yeah. your ass. I know, I know. Yeah, everybody always looked at me like I had done something, like I was out there clowning around. Right. But it was really just an unfortunate- Yeah, meanwhile, uh, Brad just needed to know about social distancing himself. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll say this, Brad Roll, if it wasn't for me, for him, he helped me so much uh, in that rehab process. The whole year, he would put me through workouts. Like, we would go out to his – he lived on the beach out there at Fort Lauderdale. I'd go out there in July, and, and he put me through these beach workouts. And if it wasn't for him, I would have never recovered from that second surgery. And so, like, that following year, I came back in 98, and I, I, I made the team again. And I ended up, you know, winning the Ed Block Courage Award. And so when we went down to Baltimore for the uh, Ed Block Courage Award ceremony, I brought Brad because he was such an integral part of, of, of my rehab. And if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have made it back from that injury. Yeah, hey, Izzo, talk a little bit about that Ed Block Courage Award, man. That's an amazing award for, you know, I remember for a player that, you know, probably is either hurt or on IR and it comes back and, and still has an amazing – following season yeah it's a it's a, it's a great great honor it's one of the things i look back on i'm very proud of is um because your teammates vote for that mm -hmm. and it usually goes to someone that overcame adversity whether it was an injury or, or most of the time it's injuries and things of that nature oh, okay. and so for my teammates to vote for me to win that it was very much uh, uh it meant a lot to me at the time and still does to this day and then the actual ceremony, when you go up to Baltimore, um, it's named for the old, I think, Baltimore Colts uh, trainer. Mm -hmm. um, but you go up there and you really end up uh, visiting with a lot of um, at-risk youth up there in Baltimore. And you spend a lot of time with these kids over that weekend. You know, you have the banquet, but then you're also there to, to spend time with these kids that really have had a rough go at it themselves. And so that 
when you're there, it just makes everything, it puts things in perspective yeah. for, um, for, you know, whatever you overcame is nothing compared to what these kids have to live through on a daily basis. So that's, that's why that, that award is very important. I feel not only for what it represents um, with your teammates voting for it, but also for, you know, going and being able to, to go out and have an impact for, for a lot of younger kids that, you know, don't have things as easy as, as we have them. So that was why that weekend was a special weekend for me personally. You know, man, there were so many great memories here in Miami is both on and off the field. Um, but, you know, after five seasons, which that in and of itself, right, a lot of guys don't have a five-year career. But after five seasons, circumstances were what they were. And, and, and you were leaving Miami and, uh, and looking for a new team. And, uh, and we don't have to talk too much about your glory days in New England. We, we know enough about it as Dolphin fans. But, of course, <laughs> you, you, you landed in New England. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many Super Bowl rings you have <laughs> in the vault up there, but it didn't start out like it was going to look like that. And, and I even remember you and I laugh about the time you were, you guys started 0-2 and, and I had my little cubicle with the Dolphins and, and it was you and, and you're like, hey man, how's it going over there? And, and I think, you know, it was still a difficult transition for you just because Miami had been home for five years and you built all these memories. And, and, and you were like, man, it's just, I just didn't, you know, it, it's just so different here. And I've never been 0-2 in my life. What was it like going through that transition? How hard was it to leave Miami? And, and just talk about that, going to a division rival who you had played against uh, for all those years. What was that transition like for you? Oh, well, so, you know, I was an unrestricted free agent. And so obviously want to just you're hoping to always be resigned by the team you're currently with at that point and so you know Miami had, had shown interest in resigning me at that time uh, both Tuan Russell and I were special teams backup linebackers uh, unrestricted and so you know they had to make a decision on you know they couldn't keep both of us right and so I went up to New England on a visit and they offered more money. Frankly, I had a better offer financially to go up there for on a four year deal. And so I remember like, you're not wanting to leave, but like there was more money up there. And so I took the money and, and went. I remember calling like Dave Wanstead at the time, like, you know, I'm in the, I'm on the side of a road, like at a pay phone up in like outside Providence. Like, you know, I had the deal in, my, in New England and I'm like calling to say like, hey, can you guys match this? And he, he was like, uh, hey, man, thanks for everything. But, you know, we're going to just re-sign Tuan. So I got a little bit more money than him. They signed Tuan, which he was a great special teams player. So they had to make a decision on keeping one guy's not two. And so I took the money, went up there. And I, I felt like, listen, in all honesty, that was a pure financial decision for me personally. Um, but it did intrigue me to go up to New England to, to co-play for Bill Belichick because I had always looked at Bill from afar and had like just some, you know, just been curious about, you know, what he was all about because he's such, it seemed like such a great coach from afar. He had been the Jets D coordinator, you know, for the most of the time I was in Miami. And so just, I was always curious about him and then going up there and meeting him. And then, you know, him wanting me, they showed a lot of love and interest. And then they financially showed the love and interest. And so it seemed like that was meant to be. But I was leaving a place that we had had a lot of success in. You know, Miami had been the divisional champs uh, or playoff team all five of my years there. Other than the first year, we went eight and eight. So we were kind of the big dog in the division, right? Juice, remember? I mean, we were we, we were the team. They were they were coming off a of five and eleven team a year, and so I was going from eleven and five division champs, second round of the playoffs, to a five and eleven team. And frankly, the facilities uh, up there at the time weren't like we were in the old Foxborough Stadium. So that was that was a new environment. I was going from South Florida. I had just bought a condo off of Los Angeles. Right. You know. It, it was a nice place to live and I was going into the unknown. You know, I ended up spending eight years there. So I, I, I grew to love Boston because that's an amazing city. But at the time, you know, my first day I go into work in the off season 
and I'm, I'm walking into the old facility. I'm just like, what did, what did I do? You know what I mean? Like you have these thoughts, like, did I make the right decision? You know, and at that point it wasn't really clear. You know, we start the year, we go to Cincy, we lose to them on the road. So we're own one. Uh, then nine 11 happens. And then, you know, we come back from that and we have a home game against the jets in which drew gets hurt. Um, where they, I mean, he, Mo Lewis comes and drills him on the sideline. Like he's bleeding internally. It was a bad injury. And so Brady comes in and, you know, finishes a game, played really well. We didn't win that game, but we we're 0-2. And I think that's what Seth's referring to is I might have made a call at that point and expressed my um, <laughs> uncertainty in the direction that we were headed, knowing that, hey, our starting quarterback just right. almost got killed. Um, and now we're, we're, we're going into week three with a backup quarterback. We're 0-2. And, again, just to frame my mindset there is, like, you remember, OJ, how much success we had in September in Miami. I think we only lost in my five years in Miami one game in September. Like, we were always starting the year. It's incredible. You know, Great starters. Great starters. starters. So, like, to be 0-2 was, like, I was a little bit in panic mode, but um, a little bit. Truth, he's like said, I went to Rice and we were never zero and two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure I wasn't the only one that was concerned about where we were going at that yeah. point. But then, you know, like anything over. in life, you know, guy goes down, it gives another guy an opportunity, and that's you know where the world was introduced to Tom Brady, who has turned out to be you know the greatest, if not one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. But at that point. You know, I can't sit here and say, oh, yeah, that's going to happen. Sure. I was a little bit concerned about being 0-2, as we all were up there at that point. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, speaking of, you know, New England, you know, you know, for years it felt like guys that leave here, Miami, and they go up to New England and yeah. kick ass. You know what I mean? And I think Coach Flo, you know, he might be the guy for us that's going to be turning that around a little bit. We can finally maybe kick some ass ourselves and, you know, put us in our, our first Super Bowl in a long time. But your first Super Bowl – have you guys won your first Super Bowl, you and T Buck and Damon Heward and, and your boy Gray Rugemer, you know, you decided to send Zach and Jed Weaver a little present, you know? And this whole thing probably is a little bit more than you anticipated with the, the, the backlash. Tell, tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, so we had this, uh, <laughs> a, you know, the Super Bowl banquet um, in June following the year we beat the Rams for the first Super Bowl. And, uh, like you said, we had four former Dolphins on that team, you know, T-Buck, Rugemer, Damon Heward, and myself. And so at the ceremony, you know, we decided that it would be an opportunity for us <laughs> to take a picture and to send that picture back to our old team, our old teammates down there back in Miami. And so I remember vividly, we, we took the picture, obviously, you know, with the rings on our fingers like just sending the, uh, you know, the salute back to our old teammates. Whose and idea so, was it is? Who said, hey, let's do this? I, I, it, was, it was my idea. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> of course it was. Um, <laughs> but so that happened. And I remember, you know, we were right there joking around with Belichick. Like, hey, we just did this. We're going to send him this picture. And then he's chuckling. He's laughing. Thought it was funny. Well, fast forward a couple months, and so now it's back into training camp of uh, 2002 now. And at that point, I think T-Buck and Gray had moved on, but it was just me and Damon still with the team. And uh, day one training camp, we had training camp at Bryant College at the time up there in Rhode Island. We go in there, and day one, Bears, you know, Bill's assistant comes over and grabs me and Damon – you know, as we're leaving a meeting, he says, hey, Bill needs to talk to you guys. And that's never a good thing, obviously. You know, you know, right. you never you never want to, you know, to get the old, hey, the head coach wants to talk to you. But we really didn't know what this was going to be about at the time. And so we get called into his office and he just, you know, just Bill being Bill, he's just real direct. He says, guys, I'm finding you guys each fifteen hundred dollars for conduct detrimental for taking this picture and sending it down there to your, your friends down there in Miami. He's like, you know, we, 
we got a hard enough time going down there every year trying to win games and we don't need to make this any harder for ourselves. And so that was a stupid thing you guys did. And I'm finding you each $1,500. And then that's that. And so obviously we were working for free for that first week of training. Camp. <laughs> and we, and that's the thing when the head man tells you that's what's going to happen, you know, you're not going to sit there and argue about it, but I will say this, this could have easily been avoided had not for Jed Weaver, who put the picture up in his locker. Hung it up in the locker. And then sure did. he put the picture in his locker. And then, of course, like, it, it, didn't, it didn't come to, you know, it, the situation was never a situation <laughs> until training camp started. And then the local media in Miami saw this picture in his locker and they asked Jed, what's that all about? And then, of course, Jed tells them, well, it's, you know, this was, Izzo sent this to us. Well, Izzo, so you're rubbing I'll, in the guy's face, man. What do you want? <laughs> I mean, you don't need to, just, it's, you send someone a picture, it's not for public. It's, it's a private matter. We, was we like had a private no text in this day and age. I was like a private text just for his eyes. <laughs> Delete this. I mean, we had no that. intention of this thing being like put up in bulletin board material. It was just a funny little joke that we, we, we came up with. So look, Bill might've been tough on you for that one. Um, but he's also, as much as we hate to admit it in South Florida, he's a man who recognizes when a player has a particular set of skills. And in, in this case, I'm not talking about your on the field skills is I really, I, I it's kind of a, I'm having trouble grabbing the right word here, uh, juice, but, but you had a certain prowess is a when, when it came to shitting. I mean, I don't know how else can I say that? <laughs> so we could, we could maybe do an entire episode on Larry Izzo shit stories. <laughs> but there's a, there, there is a special one. There is a special one that, that trumps all others. It makes all other stories seem insignificant. I know you know what I'm talking about. And uh, go, go ahead. Sh just shed some light on, on this monumental moment in your career. Well, I believe you're referring to um, <laughs> this, the 2005 uh, game at Atlanta, in yeah, which yeah. case I, I had a situation – that was it's uh, always a situation. situation. It always starts out with a situation. <laughs> unavoidable, an unavoidable situation. So all these other stories that you're alluding to, I'm not proud of. This one, I, I feel I am, I am proud about this one. To be, because I do believe whenever Bill Belichick tells you it's the first time in his 30 plus years of coaching that he's seen this happen on the football field <laughs> there's a level of pride that comes with that if you're a part of that story and so let me just give you the back back story here is all right so you remember the old georgia dome you know yep. you know domes when when a lot of people get in you know bodies are, are put in domes it becomes like hotter <laughs> you know than you walk into a, an empty dome and it's a little chilly but you put 70,000 people in the Georgia Dome, and now it's, it's a hot environment, right? It's, it's, it's equal to playing, like, outdoors in September or sometimes in Miami type of deal. So this game, you know, because of that, hydration was very much essential for me so that I would avoid cramping. And so, you know, before the games, you know, all the stuff we take, you know, back in the day, whatever. A lot of stuff you put in your body to, to play the game. And so that combined with a um, overzealous, uh, you know, staying hydrated attitude, come the fourth quarter, I had, you know, basically just created this, this problem down in, you know, in my stomach to where, like, I was about to blow. I was about to blow and it was going to come out from one end or the other. And at this point, fourth quarter, I'm basically covering a punt, running down the field and barely keeping things, you know, where they should be, you know, clenching my, 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 my <laughs> muscles as much as I can. If not, you know, we're going to have a big mess on the field. And so, I had, I, it's turf. I, it's not grass, right? So this, you know, biodegradable doesn't do you any good. I come off the field 
And I will say the mixture that led to this was Pedialyte's and Alka-Seltzer. So for some reason, like Pedialyte mixed with Alka-Seltzer was some drink that I drank to avoid cramping. And so that created a lot of combustible gas in my stomach. <laughs> and so I, I covered this punt and I'm literally like almost, you know, shitting myself on the field. I, but I hold it together and I come off the field and I, I'm like, I got to find a bathroom. And at that point, the, the locker room, the visitor locker room was all the way around the field on the other, the other side of the field. And so like, there's no bath, there's no way I can go all the way over there to the bathroom and make it back before maybe I had to be on the field again. So I had, I had no choice. I will say this right now. I had no other choice than to look around and, and find some resource that I had there on the sideline that could help relieve me of this, this problem that was occurring in my stomach. And so I found a big waste bucket, you know, like those Gatorade buckets or, you know, that, that are near the water coolers and everything like, you know, like, like a painter's bucket. And so I grab that. I quickly grab a couple teammates. I'm like, here, hold these up. They hold up some towels and I drop my short, uh, my pants and I, I let it go. And it was, it was uh, right on the unavoidable. I, it was unavoidable. It was like liquid, all liquid, just hitting the bucket, hitting the bucket, <laughs> just like a water hose. Imagine letting a water hose go into a bucket. That's what it sounded like for a good 30 or 40 seconds, okay? And so as soon as I was done, I grabbed these other towels and I clean up thoroughly because you know me, Seth, I am a very – clean and thorough person and it's i cleaned up as best i could in the environment that i was at but uh as soon as i'm done with that i dump the uh towels in the bucket and i throw the bucket over there behind the offensive line bench over to my right where the offense comes out they the linemen big, won't notice right <laughs> they got some big tub over there where all the towels go and i just threw the bucket back there and then i had to go on the field we had just scored i gotta go cover a kickoff and that was that. And so after the game, you know, everyone's well, talking about after it. After like, the game, here's my question. You know, because uh, it's different now. But in the old days, when they start holding up the towels, usually it's because somebody's injured and they want to check and see and you got to kind of undress them a little bit. And so in the press box, we're like, uh-oh, keep an eye on Izzo. He looks like he might have an injury. They're checking on him, you know. <laughs> and, and, and it's great for the people in the first 20 rows. But, but if you're in the nosebleeds, you kind of have a bird's eye view down into the towels did you feel like you know were, were the fans in Atlanta recognizing what was happening at the time or or were you just too focused on 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 your business I'd like to think that nobody noticed what I was doing okay you know, all right we'll roll with honest, that in fact to be honest with you so like a couple minutes after that happened you know guys were talking about it laughing on it on the field about it and like one of my teammates was like waving a towel behind me <laughs> And I got pissed, like, like, what are you doing, man? You're making a spectacle here. Like, nobody saw that, so why are you bringing attention to it? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so that annoyed me, uh, obviously. Uh, the one thing is, like, so we come back the next day, and in the team meeting, you know, Bill goes over the, the things that he needs to cover in the game, like that we did well and this and that, and then he starts handing out the game balls. And so he's like, I got one more special game ball to give out. And so he makes a speech. He's like, and you know, this is the first time in my 35 years of coaching that I've ever seen someone take a shit on the sideline. <laughs> and then so last game ball goes to Izzo. And then he gives me this ball. I still got it to this day. I should have brought it up here for this. It's downstairs. But it says, you know, Larry Izzo took massive shit on <laughs> sidelines, asphyxiated offensive line, three tackles. <laughs> so the thing is this, I had a great game that day. I had three tackles. We, we covered our asses off. You know, Alan Ronson was a returner. He was a Pro Bowl returner. So I had, I had, a, I had a real good game. I like to think I got the game ball for the three tackles. Sure. But the other part of it was – when I had been, when I threw the bucket over to that other little bin, <laughs> the offensive line would come over, and they had no idea what had occurred over there. And so they're like, "What is that smell? What is that?" You know, and 
that you know, <laughs> then they start talking, and it's like, oh, Izzo took a shit over there in the bucket, and blah 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 blah. But you know, to be, you know, I'm it's not. I can't say I'm proud about it, but I'm not ashamed that I did what had to be done. <laughs> right. I had I had no other option, OJ. There was no other option. <laughs> it's either that or it was going to happen in my pants, and I wasn't going to let that happen. Dude, that is that defensive lineman, linebacker. That's that mentality right there, man. Because, you know, we got some, some divas like myself would have probably just taken himself out for, you know, a whole series. But not, not Izzo. Not Izzo. Bro, hey, Seth, I don't know how to follow that up, man. But I'm, I'm, I'm well, going to can. try. I'm going to try. <laughs> All right, good luck. <laughs> Let's shift good gears luck. a little bit. Because one thing I do know about Did you say shift gears too, or did you say? Shift gears. Shift gears. Okay. <laughs> I, I do know about Izzo. I know Izzo is a, a bit of a – he's a movie buff. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? I know, uh, you know, it's not the typical movie you would think about from a, a linebacker that shits in buckets on <laughs> sidelines and, you know, runs through walls, beats up receivers in parking lots. Not not that type of movie. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's you know, it's like – from what I understand, you and Zach and Seth would have, like, movie date nights. <laughs> what's up with that is what is up with that is well you know during the season friday night you're trying to do the right thing and not go out or do anything like that and so we would a lot of times just go to movies you know and so like i you know we would take turns of picking movies but a lot of times i felt that i had the we had a choice in these films wait a minute <laughs> i don't remember picking any movies i feel like <laughs> I opened your eyes to a different uh, type of movie. Like if, you know, if it was for up to Seth and Zach, they'd go see like Iron Man and, you know, Incredible Hulk or stuff Absolutely. like that. And where I was more into the art house cinema type of stuff. You know Dude, what I mean? I'm talking like the horse whisper. Hey, Seth, we're going what, what same time. Yeah. Okay. Pick you up at seven. All right, cool, cool. What are we seeing? He goes, the horse whisper, the horse whisper. <laughs> what the hell is the horse whisper? So we saw I mean, the horse whisper, the Titanic. I think we saw I mean, Titanic together. Titanic's a great movie. I me, mean, you, me, you, and Zach. It was. I'm I mean, comfortable. I, I'm comfortable in myself that I, I can go to the Titanic with a couple guy friends. It's not a big deal. Somebody we don't was crying, to... Juice. I don't know who it was, but somebody was sniffling in that moment. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I don't know if it was Zach or Izzo, but somebody, somebody was really <laughs> moved by that film. <laughs> who wasn't moved by the Titanic, Seth? It's a beautiful movie. <laughs> a love story. Come but on. he did it. Hey, it Kate got to Winslet. the point where we I, I took his up and introduced, you know, he Scott Stone and Rodney and they were looking for content on the website and remember did at the movies with Izzo and and he started doing movie reviews and he would do his Oscar picks and it and it was something that followed you nice. throughout your career. Nice. Yeah, you know, it's uh, nowadays it's hard to to go to movies. You got I got an 11-year-old and an 18-month-old kid. But yeah, back in the day, like I love, I love going to movies. Uh, you know, that year that I was hurt, I think I went. That was one way you kill time is when you're on IR, you go and see a lot of movies by yourself. But fortunately, I had some like-minded friends like Seth and Zach <laughs> that also <laughs> like movies, and so uh, we went to movies. And I like to think that I broadened your her, horizons a little bit with some of the choices of movies that we went to. I like the the independent films things like that, that maybe you guys would not have been exposed to if it wasn't for me. I think that's fair. I, I, I have to admit that is fair. Cause I, I definitely wouldn't have gone to see the, the horse whisperer. I probably would have ended up with, with the, I mean, is it the horse whisperer? Wasn't that Scarlett Johansson's like first movie? You're the expert in the movies, bro. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> Robert I just, Redford, <laughs> Robert Redford in that one. Yeah. Too, right? Robert Redford. I do remember Robert Redford being in it for sure. And so there was another thing that would happen at these movies, uh, Juice, and it happened every time. And I don't know why we fell for it every time, but we'd, we'd get our seats and, you know, and Izzo was very particular about where the seats were. And then Zach was particular about like how many spaces between <laughs> seats, you know, cause he, he had to make that decision. And then Izzo would go off and he'd say, I'll be right back. And he'd go to the concessions and he'd come back with the largest popcorn <laughs> that they would offer. <laughs> Biggest jumbo extra whatever and i'm like well i don't even like popcorn uh and every time and then zach so i fell for it. maybe i'm the idiot i was trying yeah because <laughs> zach knew like zach would all of a sudden get up and start moving around and Izzo would inevitably trip and half the fucking popcorn <laughs> would end up in my lap every time and so he would get the large one so that he still had more popcorn than any human could eat 
because half of it was going to end up on me. Where, where did that move it. come from? <laughs> I know you did. I, know I love you did. that. I still do that to this day when I go to movies with my, my kid. Um, uh, do they fight for it like I did like an idiot every time? Every time. Yeah. Yeah, every time. Yeah, that's on you, Seth. That's on you. <laughs> it's completely on me. I'm focused on the previews and, you know, stomach full of hot popcorn. You get all agitated. You get all agitated. Yeah, I get rattled. It'll take me the first 20 minutes of the film to calm down. Good well, stuff. the movies that you're watching will calm you down pretty quick, Big Seth. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> take like a, a quick nap, huh? Yeah. No, because then he'd like quiz us afterwards, and he'd want to talk about the films and the whole deal. I mean, it was a process. It was. A, it was a <laughs> Look, I, I, you know, I know we've taken up a lot of your time. Is uh, there's one last thing I do want to share, and I have a lot of great memories. We talk about them here in the tank all the time. My eight years working in the league, and certainly the years afterwards, I've been working with JT. But one of my favorite memories in the NFL. And we've got a lot of them, man. You've been such a great friend since day one. But one of my favorite memories was every road game, literally almost from the beginning, because Zach was such an instant success. Uh, you know, he was chosen to be one of the guys that would attend the production meeting. And if you're not familiar with the production meeting, if you're listening to this, when you watch an NFL game and you hear the broadcaster say, hey, we, we talked to Zach Thomas uh, earlier in, in the week, or we talked to Dan Marino, or <laughs> what would happen is, the visiting team, we, we'd land, get off that plane, get on the buses. Uh, if we weren't doing a walkthrough at the stadium, once we got to the hotel, the broadcast team would give us a list of guys they wanted to talk to. And it was inevitably the coach, the quarterback, and then they'd pick two or three guys. They loved talking to Zach because he was the quarterback of the defense and, and you know, they, they felt like they were his buddy. And, you know, Zach had that effect where he made a, every guy in town felt like he was Zach's best friend. And so – Harvey would get off the bus. He'd grab Jimmy and go right into the production meeting because Jimmy wanted to waste no time. And then Neil Gulkis would go with Dan and he'd wait outside of Dan's room and I'd get sent up to Zach's room. Zach would be third. So I'd go up to the room. I, Juice, this was for five years we did this routine. Every time. <laughs> Knock on the door. Izzo would open up the door. Zach was always in the, in the first bed He'd have, at this point, he'd have, the, he'd have the covers over his nose, disgusted. The, the bathroom door would be open. There'd be a wire hanger completely unfolded, sticking, <laughs> sticking out of the toilet, okay? And, and his always just, hey, all right, come on in. They were watching whatever college football game was on. And then I'd come in and sit in the room and we'd yuck it up. And Zach would say, you know, tell me what Izzo just accomplished. And, and uh, we'd, you know, we would just talk and hang out. And then I'd get on the walkie-talkie. We carried those little walkie-talkies. We, didn't, we weren't texting at that time. And so Harvey would call and go, Seth Levitt, come in. Seth Levitt, come in. And I'd go, you know, go for Seth. And he goes, it's time for Zach. Send Zach down. And, and Harvey wanted – he never wanted to keep the broadcasters waiting. And so it was intense. And he made it feel like – and so every time I tried to communicate the status – or he'd, you know, he'd go, you know, hey, Seth, it's five more minutes and Danny's going to be done here. And so I would try and go – now, Harvey's in the room and all the broadcasters are there. He's on a walkie-talkie. And every time I would press the button to speak to Harvey, Izzo <laughs> would start to yell at the top of his lungs. <laughs> most obscene oh do it again Get and he would yell the most obscene thing that he could possibly think of and I said, oh, i'm cracking up and then harvey would go I, I, come again seth i couldn't hear you say it. He's in there. instead of say he would never step outside so you could hear the guys in the background and the things i can't even you know we're pretty we're pretty loose here on the show i'm not even going to tell you some of the things that were said on this radio <laughs> And I had no choice. There was nothing I could do but press the button and hope that Iz would finally have mercy on me. Fortunately, Harvey had no clue what the hell was going on, but I think everybody else in the room did. And I'll never forget it. That's awesome. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Pure gold. I love those opportunities. <laughs> to rattle your cage. It was a lot of cage rattling. Was... Every week you'd come in and, and, and you'd fall for it, just like the popcorn. <laughs> well, the popcorn I would fall for. This, I knew it was coming. And, and the hard thing for me, Juice, was to try and keep a straight face, was to right. try and talk through it. Oh, yes, Harvey will be right now. I'm laughing. I can't get the words out. Cause, and, and it was a new routine every time. Oh, Zach, yeah, baby. You know, was, <laughs> these things that he would Too say. Funny. Oh, Too God. Funny. Never good, forget good it. Good stuff, man. Never forget it, man. Yeah, yeah. buddy. Good well, stuff. Is man, we hope you and, Mara is, and and the kids are doing fantastic, man. And and uh, you know we missed the hell out of you. I know you're all the way out west, but we're, we're you know couldn't be happier for you and and your career where it's taken you. Juice, did you know? Did you see it? I, I found this, and I didn't even know this. And this is my guy. 
you have never had a losing season in 14 NFL seasons, right? 14 seasons as a player, you never had a losing season. Yeah. Eight and eight was the, the worst, worst you ever were. The worst record was our rookie year. My eight and eight was the, I mean, Damn. how lucky am I? Can yeah. you imagine? I played that? on yeah. 14 years, never had a losing record. That's got, I mean, that's just pure gold right there. Just being, you know, lucky to be a part of some great organizations and some great teams, obviously. Never had a losing season. And then the other thing I didn't know is you have the most registered special teams tackles in the history of the league. Did you yeah. Know that? You're like, yeah. I, yeah, I knew that. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a stat that obviously gets probably, you know, no one's looking to dig that up. And in this day and age, obviously, I played 14 years, so I was able to accumulate a lot of tackles, a lot of, man. A lot of tackles. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely proud about that. Um, that's something, you know, I feel like, you know, I was a guy that, you know, to just play one year was like, you know, a dream for me. So for me to be able to have a 14 year NFL career is just more than I could have ever imagined, you know, coming out of Rice. Um, and so that's why I'm so grateful to Jimmy and to Mike Westoff and the, the Dolphins organization for giving me an opportunity um, to get the ball rolling. And, uh, and then, you know, I was able to be around some, some great teams and developed some great relationships not only in Miami, New England, finished it off. That, that's one thing. You know, my last year I played for Mike Westhoff up with the Jets. You know, my 14th year I played for him up there. And so I came full circle, got a chance to play for him again. Um, but, again, it's just uh, I've, I've had a blessed – I had a blessed career, and it's, I, I won't ever lose sight of that. I was really fortunate to be uh, – around some some great teams not only in new england but obviously in miami and then develop great relationships and that's why this is really cool juice to be able to see you it's been a long time glad to see you doing well and, and so i'll meet you out in the parking lot when this is over that's <laughs> <laughs> what we started big dog no. <laughs> i love it hey you know what i love big seth and, and it is man is you, you're that same dude man that's i love man you you're that same good dude man that you know, walked in that locker room that first day, man, to, to today where you're doing big things as well in the league and, and, and coaching these young dudes now in the league that come in that, you know, teach them the right way to do things, man. So it's, a, it's an honor to have you in the tank, man. I appreciate you diving in, man. You betcha, man. You betcha. Anytime. Don't ever, 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 ever,